All right. Um, I hope you've all had a great time at Lisa. I've attended some great talks when I've not been freaking out about giving this one or about the fact that our data center at work has been shutting down for unknown reasons because of power. Um, but I've attended some great talks. One of them uh, was by Jamisha Fisher um, and uh, Lee Honeywell on automation security. Um, they gave me some really great material for this talk, which I got to plan on uh, on Wednesday morning. Matt Provost's talk on Never Again Events. Also a lot of great material for this. Um, where is Tanya hiding? You gave me a great quote. I'm going to keep on abusing it during this talk. And uh, Peter Lega, where is he? I love your talk this year and last year. Um, it gave me a really great perspective on the other direction of this talk. Um, so some of you might know, also, if anyone want to follow, follow along, I have the slides up online. I will wait for about 10 seconds for you to grab that Google short URL. Um, some of you may know me, however, from some other talks I've given, some other artifacts I've presented. And is there anyone who doesn't have that URL yet? Great. Um, I've given some talks that have centered on experiences I would rather not live through again. And it's all been about bad things that happened to me. And I'm, after last year's talk, I'm kind of tired of that topic. So instead, I decided I want to give a talk about bad things that happened to other people who were not sysadmins or DevOps or SREs or really involved with our, with our section of technology. Um, so a couple of caveats. I'm giving a talk about aviation, but I'm not a pilot. I do not work flight crew, never have. I do fly a lot as a passenger. Um, the closest I've gotten to flight crew is I will admit to having dated um, flight attendants a couple of times in my lives, which is actually a great source of information about the really ugly, dirty details of the aviation industry. Um, I'm not a doctor. Um, I've done volunteer work as a medic, so that does inform me a little bit about the medical world, but not a lot. And I'm not gonna, if you won't judge me for calling myself a sysadmin, I won't judge yourself, I won't judge you if you call yourself a dev op, an SRE, an ops engineer, because we're all really kind of doing the same thing. We're making computers computer better so that other people who use computers can computer better so they, they can do their non-computer things. So I wanna take you down a uh, little trip down memory lane. How many of you here remember the first time you got on an airplane? Mo maybe half of you, which is about my experience. I don't remember my first one. My mom says I cried. But I do remember my next flight, and I got to go to Japan with my mom, which was great. We flew on a plane very much like this one, or maybe that one, or I guess they're really the same plane. Um, <laughs> and back then, it was the 80s, and they did cool things, like give you plastic kits of the airplane you were flying on, because it was great advertising. I miss those days. United and Delta and American don't do that anymore, at least not on domestic flights. And it was my favorite toy all summer long. I, I, my dad built me a runway in the back. I got to land this thing, take it off. It was even my, I even pretended that the bathtub was a, a runway, and you were doing water landings and water takeoffs. And then in September of that year, my favorite toy disappeared. And it took me forever to figure out why. Um, I got it back a couple weeks later to do a show and tell at, 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 at elementary school. But it wasn't until I was 18 or so that I really put a bunch of events together from my childhood and figured out why they took it away from me for a while. September 1st, 1983, I was eight years old, and my parents decided that me doing water landings with a model of a 747 from Korean Airlines Flight 002, which I had flown on to Japan, was a little morbid. Um, this flight was flying to Seoul, Korea from Anchorage, drifted off course due to um, an incorrect setting of the navigational system, and short story, the Soviet Union shot it down. And all 269 people on board were lost. Among other things, geopolitical impact, conspiracy theories. About the only good thing we got out of this was that Ronald Reagan made GPS available worldwide for the entire public. That was the only good thing to come out of this. This really set me down the line to a few years later when I heard about this flight. I was maybe 14 or so. And everybody probably saw it on the TV or a recording of it on the news, you know, spectacular cartwheeling of the plane. United 232 suffered an uncontained engine failure of the number two engine, which is mounted on the tail, severing the so-called redundant three hydraulic systems that control all the major flight control surfaces of the plane. Later on, they um, determined that it was virtually impossible to land this plane. But through, through a great deal of luck and circumstances, they were able to bring the plane down and have over 60% of the uh, passengers and crew on board survive, which is amazing. Fast forward, most of you are alive now, we were alive when this happened, most of you know about this flight, the uh, so-called miracle on the Hudson. US Airways 1549 struck a bunch of Canada geese. 
I'm not sure how the Canada, Canada geese felt about this, but it did result in immediate loss of thrust on both engines, but somehow the flight crew was able to bring the plane down to a successful ditching in the uh, Hudson River over by the USS Intrepid. Everybody on board survived with almost no serious injuries. I think the biggest injury was a huge gash in the leg from someone trying to get off the plane. But not too long after that, Air France 447, they had an icing over of an airspeed sensor, which happens occasionally when you're flying at that altitude over the Atlantic. And uh, this caused some airspeed consistency errors. The flight crew then proceeded to engage in a number of inappropriate flight control inputs, which caused a sustained stall of the airplane at 38,000 feet, all the way down for three and a half minutes until it impacted with the water. 228 people on board, deadliest crash in the uh, history of the airline. So we got two outcomes here. We have two flights with major mechanical problems. And in one case, everybody survived. In the other case, way more people than you had any right to expect survived. And then you have two flights with at most transient mechanical or entirely recoverable errors. Everybody dies. What's going on here? Why do we have this contradiction? Um, people like to point at things like pilot error, people, people making good decisions. Um, and the, the, result, the reality is that there isn't really a single simple answer. It's, for lack of a better term, a constellation of factors that align one way or another. If you have 30 slices of Swiss cheese and you line them in the right way, you have a couple of holes that go all the way through. If you line them the other way, there's no way for things to get through that stack of Swiss cheese. So sometimes it matters which way you stack your Swiss cheese. And we can't discount luck. Luck played a great deal of, was a huge factor in a lot of these incidents I'll be talking about. This is a quote from Alan Deal. He is an, a former NTSB in, uh, investigator. He works in human performance. Pilot error is not the answer to your question. It is a symptom of something else. If pilot error is your, is your answer to why something went wrong, you're not looking hard enough. If a system goes down because an op, because a sysadmin made a mistake, the question is, why does one sysadmin mistake result in the system going down? This is a quote from Dave, Donald Dolan. He works in aviation safety as an attorney, and he was involved in the, uh, in the case of the uh, Boeing 737 um, rudder fault. This caused, I think, a handful of accidents in the 80s. Um, good design removes the defect. It does not expect the person dealing with the system to deal with it perfectly and do everything correctly in emergencies. They've had the, uh, aviation has had this lesson for at least 20 years, if not 30. So what happened? Well, Korean Airlines, um, with Korean Airlines uh, Flight 007, the pilots didn't notice the navigation was set incorrectly. The, long story, the short story is that it was bad UI. They didn't notice. It was really easy to miss. And if we have time, I'll show you pictures of how easy it was to miss. Um, not enough civilian radar coverage. For some reason, we weren't cooperating with the Soviet Union at the time for civilian air, cover, civilian air uh, radar coverage over the uh, Pacific Ocean. I don't know why. Um, we didn't have really good cooperation between civilian and the uh, military either at the time. But there were signs that something was wrong. The pilots had to relay their communications with air traffic control and flight service systems through other, air, through other airlines. If they wanted to do it on their own, they had to use a different frequency band, which was not as clear. Um, flights that were on the same route as them were reporting vastly different weather patterns, and nobody picked up on this. The Soviet Union was predisposed to view anything involving any plane in, 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 in entering their airspace to be US aggression against them. And as it happened, they had an early warning radar site that was offline that would have caught the airplane, the, the flight, on its first overpass of the Soviet Union, and it would have given the Soviet Air Defense Forces two additional hours to actually identify and properly identify it as a civilian air flight. So what happened here? We had bad UI, we got complacency, monitoring, confirmation bias, incident response, or bad incident response. Kind of sounds like us. United 232. Redundant, impossible, you use these words, but I don't think they really mean what you think they mean. Um, they had a really quick diagnosis. Um, we can't make the plane what we want, but in this case, there was no checklist. There was no manual. This was considered virtually impossible and therefore was not considered in the flight manual or the quick response handbook or any other checklists. Luckily, they had a uh, 
pilot and a UAL flight instructor on board who had studied a previous flight, uh, Japan Airlines 123, which suffered a similar loss of hydraulic control and had studied how they were able, how would, how would I, had studied it for years how to uh, get a flight, how to get a plane down that had lost its flight control surfaces like that. So they came up with this ad hoc way of doing it, which is kind of like saying, I'm going to take all four wheels of my car and drive them individually and get my car to turn, except you're doing it in three dimensions now, not two. Um, they had, United Airlines is also a pioneer what's called crew resource management, which I'll talk about later. But the flight deck crew was a textbook example of a group of people coming together, working well together, without ever really having met each other, and resolving a really difficult situation as successfully as they could. National Guard was on duty at the airport. That was a stroke of luck. You had hundreds of trained responders who follow orders really well. And there was a shift change at the local hospitals. So you had double the staff. So we have fault intolerance. I don't want to call it fault tolerance. Uh, we've got good, mo we have monitoring. We have good team ops. I used to call this meet ops, but this can, gets confused with meetings, so I'm going to call it team ops. And huge strokes of luck. Luck favors the prepared. U.S. Air, what happened? Oh, they figured out really quickly what happened. They saw the birds hit the plane. They figured it out really fast. They started going through all of the, they did a lot of things off the checklist that the checklist didn't call for at the time, because they didn't really have a checklist for loss of both engines at 3,000 feet. The checklist is for loss of both engines at 20,000 feet or higher. So they activated all the systems they had to, give, to keep the electrics going while their engines were out. Um, they didn't do things like, oh, how can I get to the nearest run runway and land there? They said, how can we get all the people on this plane somewhere safe? So instead of focusing on, I want to get to a run runway any way possible, they said, where's the safest place to bring this plane down and get everyone home? It turned out to be the Hudson. A320 is rated for water, over water flight, so you got all the supplies you need for landing in the water. And here's the interesting bit. It was the first time together for these two pilots flying together. They had never met before. Um, good training made it possible for them to work together in an amazingly stressful and difficult situation and achieve a good outcome. In fact, it was the first time flying an A320 after training for the co-pilot. So, go team. And Air France 447 is the flight that makes me sad. And it's the flight that, that actually um, has, over the last five years, motivated me to give this talk. Sensors go bad. It happens. How many times has Nagios lied to you and every now and again? How many times has a temperature sensor lied to you about something? It happens. And it's transient. It goes back to normal. You figure out what, what's going on with the sensor. You replace it, or you mark it as a check it again, check it again. But they didn't have training for dealing with this. They didn't have training, training for what happens when the airspeed sensors decide to disagree, or at least they didn't have enough training. They didn't have enough training in manual flight at 38,000 feet. Did you know that it's possible to stall an Airbus if you, if, you, if you knock it over just the right way? The Airbus is supposed to be non-stallable. You're supposed to not be able to make an Airbus stall unless you take away all of its sensors. So if your sensors are inconsistent and you pull it into a stall, it will never tell you. Um, so what did the pilot do? Um, he, did a, he did a very human thing. He found the closest thing in his training that fit and went with it. It just happened to be exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, confusingly, the, um, the anti-stall system would re-engage once they had enough airflow over the, plane, over the wings to actually engage the airspeed sensors. So while you're trying to bring the plane out of stall, it tells you you're in a stall again. So what do most humans do when they get an alarm? They stop doing the thing they were doing and they pull it back. So they never left the regime where they could actually get to the point. They never pushed through the regime where the, where the um, flight control system was telling them, giving them good information, and they never followed their training to do stall recovery. Neither co-pilot, neither of the two pilots knew what the other one was doing. On a Boeing, if you pull back on a stick, the other pilot feels it. On an Airbus, if you pull back on a stick, the other pilot doesn't notice unless they're looking at you or they lock you out. And the captain was on rest break. This was very crucial. There was no one really in charge. You had two co-pilots. Not a pilot and a co-pilot, not a captain and a pilot, but two relatively pe people with a relatively equal status in the very shallow hierarchy of the flight deck. Bad things happened. 
And as a result, um, a lot of people died on that flight. And it took us about a year and a half to find the remains of the plane and the flight data recorders to even figure out what happened. So this is really starting to sound a lot like what we do, but maybe with higher stakes. They have bad UI, the plane crashes. We have bad UI. I don't know what that, that, that button I pushed. I don't know what it did, but it didn't do what I thought it would do. Um, I am never going to really understand Paxos or Raft. I'm sorry. I'm just not sm as smart as my grad students. So there's a lot of things that we are operating with, that I'm operating with, that I don't truly understand. I don't really truly understand the, nit the nitty gritty of consensus algorithms, and I use them every day. Um, obviously, we work in large teams. Very few of us are working truly solo anymore. How many of you have had an entire batch of hard drives die all at once? Yeah, I had a batch of uh, SSDs go bad. That was about $10,000 at once. Um, the last one's funny. This happened to the National Science Foundation. Two name servers in the same room on the same circuit, hit by lightning strike. <laughs> Apparently, the um, NSF was offline for about a day and a half. Right as a bunch of faculty were trying to apply for uh, for deadlines for grants. Um, so other similarities. Um, a lot of these fields I'm going to talk about came out of World War II. A lot of complex systems, humans. Humans interacting with humans in non very complex ways. Customer support challenges. While I would never, I would, I would never think that what I do is as hard as what a United customer gate, a customer agent has to deal with. We both have really challenging support challenges. And again, we don't always understand the systems that we're running. Um, can, how many of you have ever yelled at your vendor? A lot of you. Yeah, we have occasionally bad relations with our vendors. Um, if I have time, I'll talk about Qantas uh, Flight 32. This last one hit me a couple of months ago. Very significant ethnic and gender imbalances. On the flight deck, it is about 90% white male. That might actually be worse than the gender balance in my department. Um, so there are a lot of differences, though. A bunch of them, you know, they have interchangeable staff, interchangeable equipment. Um, they have much stricter time demands. Um, their platforms are, are, are traveling through space and time, but not like the TARDIS. Um, they get formal training. How many of you actually got formal training to do your job? <laughs> yeah, okay. They have a limited number of platform support. Southwest is all Boeing 737s. How many platforms do you have in play for yourself and your organization right now? Dozens at, at a minimum? But here's the big one. When our systems go down, we're like, it'll be back in 20 minutes. Whatever. We'll live, we'll lose some money. People will be unhappy with us. We'll tell sad stories, and we'll you know, give each other hug-ups. And that is not an option in the flight industry. So before I, well, let's see here. So I will come back to this. But all of these fields here came out of World War II development. Air travel, nuclear power, emergency medicine came into its own in the form that, in the form that we recognize, at least, space flight. All of these things, even the electronics industry came out of World War II, as did computing and sysadmin. Sysadmins came out of Bletchley Park and the Women's Royal Naval Service. They were the first sysadmins, and they were all women. <laughs> but, so we're not, really not, we're not that young, but apparently we're the least mature of all these fields. Um, Jamisha Fisher said something really great about working in suck ops uh, in, in this current era, which is it's like the Wild West, so YOLO. And I really identify with that, because that's how, kind of how I feel about when I'm doing my work and working with others, no matter where they're working at. We're always working a little bit at the edge. We're always pushing things a little further. And sometimes things break on us a lot more than sometimes we plan for. Now, I said I was going to come back to something. Um, the question I often get a lot is that, is this a fair comparison, John? And I'll be honest, they, there's some really high standards in aviation. If you go by the, the metric of nines, for us, the magic number of five nines comes up a lot. That's six minutes of downtime. But if you're flying at the rate that commercial aviation flies, that works up to about one air crash every day, which is clearly unacceptable. On US flag airlines, on scheduled flights, there have been zero passenger fatalities since 2009. That's amazing. That's millions and millions in flights, and nobody has died as a result of flying on a plane. Now, I don't know if that number includes people who have heart attacks while flying on planes or suffer their own you know, medical maladies, but still, that's amazing. And, but the, I don't know, this is probably not the right way to think about things, though. 
this is not a good comparison because we obviously don't have to maintain live safety standards right now. We don't need to maintain eight nines. Hell, some of us are happy with three nines, to be honest. Are, are, any, are any of you happy with two nines? All right, Chris, he's happy with two nines. So obviously, clearly, his work does not need the level of, of reliability that the airlines have. But maybe, maybe a better way to think about it is about a spectrum of choice. And so I'm not here to tell anybody here that they're doing it wrong, because even if you are doing it wrong, that's not the point. My, my, job, my, what I'm, my goal here is to help you find better ways to do your job, to steal ideas from others, to take the ideas you've already stolen but don't know it, and, and codify them and, and formalize them and recognize what you're doing. So they can do more than just do a better job or do it cheaper or do it easier, but that you can make better decisions. You can find better tools, more informed ways of thinking about things so that you can make better trade-offs between all of these many demands that are placed upon us and our, and our resources, as opposed to just throwing your hands up and going, whatever. Or we're going to um, write it and you do it on the back of an envelope and figure it out and go from there. Because already we're at a point now where the technology we support and develop has, has the ability to impact millions of people and soon billions of people. If you look at these companies, some of these companies control huge amounts of the data that we consume and the data that we put out. Some of them control our lives, our health care. Apple Maps controls how we end up getting misdirected onto a runway while trying to find the terminal. And then you have some of these other companies that have lost their data, that have given it up to criminals. Um, we might, you know, none of these companies may be killing people yet, but they are definitely in a position to ruin people's lives. And if any of you think that you're not doing life safety critical stuff and it won't be for a while, that's changing. Um, this is the scariest talk title I ever saw at work, which is machine learning applications for air traffic control. Um, I got so scared that I deleted the mail from my phone before I had a chance to read it. And I'm kind of glad. Um, but we already have self-driving cars. If you go to Pittsburgh, you can get a self-driving Uber. Not like a test Uber, but like it's their real production service and you can get one of these things. I don't know where that machine learning came from. I don't know who trained it. I don't know who's even supporting it. I don't even understand half the math that goes on behind it. And yet one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna end up supporting this stuff. And probably some of you are too. All of these providers that we like using, they're gonna start supporting health applications, hosting health data. AWS already has a HIPAA compliance zone for hosting your health data. There's at least two startups represented in this audience who deal with warehousing of data for health applications. And we already have 911 handled by VoIP systems, which have crashed or limited the number of calls incoming to a center through bad coding, hard-coded magic numbers, and probably have caused at least one death. So maybe that buffer between us and life safety critical isn't really, as, isn't really as cushy as we think it is. It's probably already gone for some of us. For some of us, it may be there forever. But for most of us, it's probably shrinking a lot faster than we realize. So I'm going to help you steal ideas from other people, because I've been doing, the, I've been doing this for last year. And um, for those who don't know Bloom's cognitive taxonomy, here's sort of the, the stages of stealing, stealing ideas from others. You repeat it. You apply it. You understand it. Eventually, you come up with new ideas. And then hopefully, we share and repeat and do this process over and over again. Um, in 1999, this was um, from Anderson and Patterson, who presented a uh, retrospective paper in 1999, Lisa. And this was uh, their, uh, their view of the worst cycle we go through. Happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. And there was one thing that they left out of this. And I'm going to pull um, a work cycle out of um, a life cycle um, from emergency response, which is prevention, preparation, response, recovery, and learning, which is we're really good at the part about responding. We are gung-ho about dropping our laptops, running off and fixing something. That is almost bred into us, whether we like it or not. We're OK about preparing for things once we've gone through it. We're really bad at prevention. I mean, OK, maybe you know, I, will remember to mem I will remember to put enough disks into the rate array so that it has enough to chew through while I'm sleeping. But we're kind of bad at prevention. We're getting, really good. We're getting much better though at learning from our recovery experiences, though. Um, 
So I said something about people and the decisions they make, and I realized that I cut out a slide because I had too many slides. But ceiling idea, how many uh, took high school literature in the United States? So you, you might under, you, probably most of you understand the four different forms of conflict, narrative conflict. And this is actually a useful metaphor thing for thinking about the kinds of decisions, good and bad, that people have to make in our field. Nature's out to get you. You can't beat nature. And there's all these incidents. Um, fuel line icing when they didn't expect it. Um, there's a cloud provider that had a drive failure because the power cord ran too close to the electronics board and caused disk queue for hours on end. Um, volcanic plumes um, either, kill, either um, stop flights you know, or they bring flights out of the air. Um, how many of you were in Iceland uh, in Europe back about three years ago? So a, a large number of people got trapped in Europe because I, a volcano kept flights down for like two months. Um, Canada geese, we talked about all these weird weather effects. Um, it's also trying to kill us through unknown phenomena we never knew about before. To come in arrows, we did not understand aeroelastic flutter because planes weren't flying fast enough yet to figure that out. Um, the Havilland Comet for falling out of the air because we didn't understand metal fatigue and aluminum yet because at that time, planes built out of aluminum got shot down before they actually broke apart due to metal fatigue. We never had a chance to figure that out until we actually did it with civilian planes. And no matter what you do to try and withstand nature, it's going to work to beat you. We might be kind of intelligent, but nature's super persistent. <laughs> um, person versus society. So what is, what is society? What is culture? It's all those shared things that, that define us, that, that, tell, that sort of inform who we are, drive our decisions, um, drive our needs and values. And it happens at all sorts of different levels, ranging from, you know, from worldwide to your own personal culture. And we bring that in, in, in with us every day to the office. And this causes lots of conflicts person versus the system. How many have had to deal with a poorly designed system that you couldn't figure out how to use? RT, Jira, Suvamity. Because that's, that's been my life, that was my life about a month ago. Um, in ergonomics, there is no average person. There's a range, but if you look at an average person, the average person doesn't exist. Um, automation. Flight industry has been in automation for a while. And usually problems with automation happen when they try and fight the automation. I'm not sure where we are on that scale, whether or not we're fighting with our automation, or if it's fighting with us, or if we're suddenly learning to get along with our automation. But I don't think we're quite as mature as the flight industry yet. And everywhere you go, there's insufficient testing, even in the flight industry. There are always design flaws, things we didn't catch, things they didn't think of. And the clock says zero minutes, so I'm a little worried. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Oh, that's dangerous. Um, person, versus, so, and then person versus others. We deal with every day with working with people. We work with customers, our coworkers, our managers, our vendors, um, or in the case of aviation, air traffic control, the ground crew, the gate agents, some of them they may, they may never even see, much like us in working with SecOps and NetOps sometimes. I almost never see my network engineer. Um, how many of you have ever been sent for communication training? That's about typical for the industry. In the flight industry, it's 100% compliance because they're proactive and we're reactionary in that sense. And even the documentation and training that we, that we write and provide to people, that's, that's, that's our interaction with other people at a distance. Ah, yes, humans are terrible. Thank you, Tanya. Humans are really terrible. Um, we are... <laughs> In, in, the, in, the, in the flight industry, this is, in, in the aviation industry, this is called human performance factors, or as I like to call it, we're our own worst enemy. Um, we are bad with stress management. We are highly evolved monkeys or primates that are designed around pattern matching. We are good at single purpose, what's called the OODA loop, which is basically how we intake new input, make decisions, and deal with it. We're good, really good with single purpose things. We're really bad with lots of things. We get tired. It's really annoying that I have to go, in bed, to, go to bed every night and that I get tired around 10 o'clock at night. Um, but we also get distracted really easily. We don't lose, we sometimes lose our skills. How many of you forgot how, how many of you still know how to ride a bike? Most of you who, yeah. How many of you still remember how to set up BGP without looking at anything? Yeah, BGP, something like that. Um, and we have this whole list of things that are bad, that are wrong with this called cognitive biases that I'll touch on very briefly because there's too many of them that basically make us, lead us down the road towards making bad decisions. So. 
someone asked me, are we doing, someone actually asked me, I think on Wednesday, are we doing any of this stuff already? Is the, are, you know, are people around us doing this kind of thing? And we seem to have gotten on to the idea that we should do postmortems or event reviews or retrospectives or root cause analysis, whatever you want to call it, which is figuring out what happened and how do we keep it from happening again, which is an idea that came from everything from medicine, uh, military after action reports, nuclear regulatory commission. Um, we seem to have gone on to the idea that these, sh these should be blameless, that they, sh they should be objective, factual, and, and actionable. Um, this was not the case, say, five years ago. But what I'd like to see is more like the ADWS, S3, and GitLab outage reports. Not quite so much like the talk I gave where half of my slides were redacted for legal reasons. <laughs> and definite lot, definitely not like the Berkeley email outage we had about, I can't do math, uh, seven years ago, six years ago, actually during Lisa. Um, because I don't think they ever did a postmortem. And they kind of swept it under the rug because the CIO took another position elsewhere. So we're doing it, we're getting better at it, and we have lots, but we do have room for improvement. Um, what kind of improvement? Collective reports. If you go to any of these places, you can find all sorts of curated, organized information about things that went wrong in that field. NASA's got an, an aviation safety reporting system where pilots can anonymously report things that don't merit an FAA or NTSB investigation. Near misses, um, safety lapses, everything, anything. Um, you could say that we use Reddit for it, but one, Reddit isn't very anonymous when you get down to it, and it's not very organized. Um, I, used to have, I used to climb a lot, I used to do rock climbing, and the Alpine Club produces a yearly report on accidents in, um, in North America. Um, it costs money, but RAI provides a uh, sort of a five takeaway summary every uh, year when this comes out, and so there's a link there for that. The FAA produces a bunch of um, retrospectives on lessons that have been learned. So they don't just go through the accidents, but, but they provide overall themes. Half my material is probably from that website when I think about it. Um, you got NTSB's own investigations. If you like reading paper versions of things instead of getting the, 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 the short version from watching air crash investigation, there are investigations going back to the 19, I want to say 1956. It's a lot of reports. So I would love it if I could get everyone's outage reports, even anonymously, and be able to look through them and see, find common themes and see, are we as a, as, a, as, a, as a profession getting better at this? The one downside is that this probably requires some kind of third party external organization, which leads to a dirty word in this profession that I will talk about at the end. We're getting good at testing. People seem to be on the idea we should do code review, we should do continuous integration even if you do have to run Jenkins to do it. Um, we understand code coverage. We, we've understood code coverage for the last 20 years, at least from programming systems and programming languages. The hard part that remains is writing the requirements for the tests. We don't always know what to test. So there's a lot of challenges to write that remain ahead for us here, but I think we're on the right path. And if anyone really disagrees with me, I won't argue with you. But since we're gonna talk about test coverage, <laughs> Um, anytime, how many of you ever said, that can't possibly happen? How many of you are lying when not, by not raising your hand? Okay, <laughs> okay. Every time, you, every time I found myself, I have now found myself, every time I say that's impossible, that can't happen, I've now made it a habit to write a test for it somewhere, <laughs> to write some kind of exception handler to exit gracefully and send me a lot of angry email. Um, how many of you do only do testing over the envelope of performance that you expect to hit? Okay. How many of you only do worst case sections of the envelope? There was an airplane that um, went down because the requirements for testing used the engine at max thrust while throwing hurricane force winds at it in water. They did not test at low thrust. So there wasn't enough engine going to get rid of all the water that was going in the airplane when it was going through a storm on descent. Lost both engines. Landed somewhere on some marshy piece of land uh, by New Orleans. Um, I, think you all know the I think you all know this joke about, oops, I wanted to double click that, but I can't. Um, I think you've all seen about the jokes about how things pass unit tests, but they don't, they don't pass integration tests. This happens in the flight industry too. Um, and when you say something's redundant, the question really is, what is it redundant against? If I run, a, if I run ZFS, 
i'm redundant against a fair number of things. i'm not redundant against the floor collapsing because i had too big of a storage array, though i'm not redundant against someone breaking into the into the machine room and stealing you know five petabytes of data in someone's dissertation so when you say redundant, ask yourself what you're redundant against how many of us make a small little change and don't think about the testing ever you, we've all done it at least once the MGM, grand, MGM had a fire in, in uh, 1950 in Las Vegas. It was not required to have sprinklers by code because the restaurant was designed for 24-7 operation because it's Vegas and nothing ever closes in Vegas, right? So they figured they, had, they would have staff there all the time and people to notice when something caught fire, except it was closed for renovation. And aluminum and copper don't play along well, and then they corrode. And so then you have live conduit, refrigerant, copper piping. So basically, the fire had about two hours to develop without anybody noticing until a staff member happened to take a shortcut through. They couldn't find the fire extinguisher. They didn't have one. Some people died. A lot of people got injured. Now, when we do tiny little changes now, we have Jenkins, we have Travis, we have Concourse, we have pull request builders, we have things, good testing that should help us mitigate this problem. But how many of you have tiny little batches of scripts on your laptop that you use all the time? Little ugly little for each scripts, bits of Python, wrappers around PSSH. We all do. And how many times do you make a change and not stick it back through a test battery? I'm not going to judge you if you don't raise your hand, because I'm not either. And I know I've done it. <laughs> um, we're also pretty good at checklists, finally. It took a long time, but not as long as it took doctors to get on the checklist. Doctors were just resisted checklists for something like a decade or two. And that's pretty bad considering they're life safety critical. Um, someone described uh, checklists to me as human automation. We are trying to mitigate human fallibility by scripting human behavior. It's not as good as a real test suite or a script, but it's what we have if you've got to do something interactively. And the magic is that if you keep on using them and following them over and over again, even if you're not looking at it half the time, you find that you get better adherence to your procedures. Airlines have even gotten, gone to the point now of having checkpoints or perhaps safe points on their checklist because their checklists are three to four pages long. So if you get interrupted during your checklist and you've lost your place, do you start at the beginning or you try and guess where you left off? In airlines now, you can just say, oh, I was at such and such and such. I just have to restart my level now. I mean, I mean not level. That's not a, it's not a game. Uh, my section. So I think we buy into this. I think we're doing this. All I'm going to say is keep it up and keep improving. I certainly have lots of improvement to make. But since I was speaking of humans who are terrible, I'm going to talk about things that we don't do or really address really well. Humans are bad in a lot of situations. We don't deal well with, with saturation of input. Um, it's called alarm saturation or helmet fire. We're really bad at multitasking no matter what we tell ourselves. Um, we can overcome some of this with training and practice. But on the far side, we're really bad when we get bored. If we're not doing enough, if we don't have something to keep our interest, we stop paying attention, and that's also bad. And this can be alleviated by better automation in some cases. Let's have the machine take care of the repetitive, boring stuff for us, the stuff we know how to do but can't seem to manage to pay attention to. But there's a lot of holes in between here. We're also bad at something called cognitive load under stress, which is kind of maybe a general catch-all for what all this is. And there's a very long paragraph out of, out of this textbook I have uh, called Emergency Airway Management, but basically it says we are bad under, under pressure, under stress, and under time constraints. Um, we don't notice lost time. We don't notice that we're losing performance, that we're performing worse and worse. So we're really bad not only at keeping up, but also self-monitoring. Because ultimately, we're, uh, we're a furious pattern matchers. This is how we evolved as primates. Um, under stress, we find the best fit, whatever it is. Maybe it's the thing we learned most recently. Maybe it's something that bit us two years ago. Um, and we can always get new patterns, but you've got to train. You have to, you have to train to get them. And the really, really annoying part is that if you make small changes to the patterns, it's sometimes really, really, really hard to change. How many found it much easier to learn to drive, to learn to do, use a completely new piece of software than to deal with the three small things that change in the next version? That's me. I'm bad with small changes. I, I, if, it's, if, it's, 
if it's something that doesn't matter and won't kill me, i'll learn eventually. but if it's something that is really tiny and is going to cause me grief it's probably going to cause me grief a lot because we're highly evolved but the question remains what are we highly evolved for i've seen lots of answers to this and i'm not sure i like all of them or any of them really um so in the airline industry they have what's called um the sterile cockpit rule during critical operations um you're supposed to minimize the amount of the amount of conversation not related to what you're doing um and this is really good for minimizing distractions and i'd like to see more of this happen um the first time i learned i really thought about this was when we were dealing with a department wide wireless outage and we had 10 people in the room including me from research and then um someone else walked in and started jabbering and asking lots of questions and how's it going and hey what's going on and he wasn't qualified to be in the room so one of us and i won't say who this guy um turned around and asked him to leave and kicked him out and that's probably something we should see more of when you're working a critical operation whether it's in response or because you're doing something really ugly like upgrading jenkins you should not feel bad about sticking yourself in a room with you and the two people you're working with closing the door and saying do not disturb unless the place is on fire and i do realize the humor of me saying fire given my last talk <laughs> um something else um i think secops has gone on the idea of an incident command structure because they do a lot of incident response which means that if you have a big enough response you start parceling out tasks you are in charge of keeping the customers informed you are in charge of making sure everybody has knows what everyone else is doing you're in charge of database re-replication you're in charge of finding out where the backup tapes are just in case we have to go to tapes and this is a really good way to structure um all of your incident responses and it's not a horrible way to handle some of your more routine operations if they're really big and ugly um i mentioned that humans are horrible because of cognitive biases the more the more intelligent we get the smarter we get the better we get at deceiving ourselves um and i can't go through all of these because there's a lot of them because humans have gotten really creative at deceiving at deceiving themselves because they're because they're terrible um i think you all know this picture by now does anybody not get this reference um normalization of deviance that's when we say well it can't be that bad it's happened 10 times already and nothing bad has happened so it's okay if we if we if we deviate from the procedure if we deviate from the engineering docs if we decide not to hold 100% adherence to all of the standards and regulations about this and that's basically us saying eh it's fine it's okay nothing bad has happened this will catch up with you eventually um another one in the really a pair when it's called confirmation bias another one's called look elsewhere where we defend our existing beliefs whether they're explicit or implicit by either interpreting things to fit our beliefs or by looking really hard for explanations for the things that don't fit um this is a quote from the major who was the pilot who shot down Korea Airlines flight 007 which was obviously and definitively a civilian flight well you can just turn it into a military flight so clearly you know people are capable of deceiving themselves and saying well this is the way i want it to be or i'm going to explain away why it was the way you say it was because it's really the way i say it was um so when we and when we take these cognitive biases writ large we end up with tragedy often we end up with flights being shot down um we end up with repeat near miss we end up with challenger and columbia coming down because managers downplay the severity of engineers concerns um when we have repeat near misses they can often lead to confidence in one's ability to get themselves out of the problem situation how many times have you said oh wow i nearly got bit by that one how many of you have had a near miss on you know on the keyboard somewhere <laughs> how many said wow let's not do that again <laughs> and how many of you actually wrote down and figured out what happened and made a note of it so that it didn't actually happen again uh, not quite as many of you <laughs> and this plays a lot into um um ethics for me and organizational culture culture especially when you're one, you're the one lone objector to everyone else's decisions because you're backing it up with engineering and they're backing it up with uh, magical thinking um sometimes ethics fails eth you know we have ethics fails because people didn't know how to do things and they had no business designing something this was the case with a lot of early bridges like the tay bridge in uh, i think 1866 um 
in the Kansas City disaster at the Hyatt in Kansas City, it's now a Sheraton, um, building walk, uh, walk, oh, suspended walkways collapsed for a number of reasons, including which the engineer who signed off from the engineering firm on the documents barely designed it to sustain 50% of the design load. And then rubber stamp approved field modifications that reduced it by another 40 to 50% and didn't actually do the load calculations. This changed a lot in the field. Um, at least in, 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 in Kansas City, you're now required to get a second engineer who is not from your firm to sign off, of it, uh, off on your documents. Um, I believe it actually has to be from the city. But we also have a lot of, we've also seen some non-fails. Um, how many of you live in New York? How many know about the weird city group building that's got all the corners are unsupported, but the, 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 the supporting towers are actually in the middles of the sides? And that was, to, that was actually to, to, so that they wouldn't have to kick a church out because the church didn't want to give up its land. Um, the chief engineer for the building discovered through a conversation with a, a grad student who was asking questions for a paper that the building was insufficient to withstand wind from, a certain, from um, the corners, which was not in the building codes. The building codes did not require them to look at a certain case. They brought it, so he brought it up to the company, to his company, to Citigroup, and before the hurricane started, hurricane season started about two months later, they managed to um, reinforce and retrofit the building without having to evacuate. Um, and more importantly, they said, we love you. We're, we would hire you for a building anytime. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of response you want to say. If you bring something up, if you acknowledge or fail and come up with a solution that you don't get penalized for it, we hope that you get rewarded for it. Or, um, at the University of California, um, this happened about two years ago. We had a um, bulk traffic monitoring system installed by the university office of the president, and staff were told, do not inform faculty. Faculty are the one group of people on campus you can't fire. Staff are. Fortunately, the faculty found out. Um, this resulted in a very long conversation with uh, the New York Times and a few other newspapers. Um, so I mentioned uh, something called crew resource management. Um, commercial aviation suffered a huge number of tragedies due to poor communication in the cockpit and poor task management. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but they came up with something called crew resource management. And the idea behind crew resource management is that they have found a way for people to people for co-pilots and captains and flight engineers and, and flight attendants to all talk to each other, give each other information, ask good questions, while respecting the hierarchy that exists on the flight deck, which is really important. Um, and it's now been applied to a bunch of other areas, such as you know, uh, maintenance operations, um, firefighting, even healthcare. And it's now required training for every single flight crew in the US and the EU in some form. Um, and the results are that flight crew know how to, how to communicate with each other, Flight crew are now even less dependent on knowing their, you know, their, their co-pilots and their flight attendants personally as extensively as they used to. Um, and the biggest result is the dramatically reduced incident rate. And when I say dramatically, I will say this. Um, Korean airlines did not have a CRM program in place before about 1999. Before that, they were suffering a number of um, very extensive incidents um, that were related both to um, mismatches between the, the cockpit design and cultural expectations um, of all sorts. And if I have time, I'll talk about the cultural expectations later. Um, but ever since they instituted this, no fatal, no fatal flight incidents since 1999. So it's been close to 20 years. So it works. So maybe we should do some kind of communication training, not as a, you don't know how to communicate and you pissed off two people in your office, so you're gonna go to communication training. But maybe we should do communication training as part, of our, as part of our onboarding, as part of our bringing people into a team of, this is how we talk in our team, this is how we communicate with each other, and we'll train you how to do it so that you can be part of our team, as opposed to treating you like an outsider who doesn't know the right magic words. Um, because when you do this, it promotes communication, it makes it clear who's doing what, and if you do it the right way, people still get to have this idea that I have my personal culture, but this is the way I deal with people at work, which if you don't train people to do it, to do it is really hard for people to do. Um, this is one of those slides I came up with um, two days ago, I'm sorry. Um, but um, when you, you need to match the training that you give people to the systems that you make them use. If you design a system that requires two people to cooperate 
or to interact in a certain way. You need to train people how to interact that way, how to work together that way. Otherwise, every time you deploy that system and use it, it's going to be a bunch of fail. Um, which brings us to how culture matters. Um, even in the case of the mostly white male commercial aviation flight deck, all of those people are coming from different hometowns, different backgrounds, different cities, different educational backgrounds. And, this, and so once you account for the rest of the diversity that I've been, I've, I've been blessed to see here at USENIX, we're definitely coming all from very different cultural backgrounds of all different kinds. And how do you take that into account when you bring them all into the same room, put them on a team, and say you're working together? This is not something we do a good job at. I work with a small team of three to four people, and it took us five years to figure out how to do this until we finally sat down and figured it out um, for ourselves. Um, because I'm going to, because the short version is that how do you, how can you get somewhere together with other people if you don't know where you're coming from? Sure, you're all in the same room in the same place, but you have all these different assumptions about each other, about what a word means, about what a phrase means, about what the word up and down mean, and about what the words left and right mean. Um, going a little faster, talking about UI interactions with bad systems. Um, the systems that were in place on Korean Airlines 007 did not tell the pilots clearly enough that they were in the wrong, they, they were not on the right track. Um, Air France 447 um, was not clear enough about telling them when there were the different regimes that the flight control system could not handle. Um, Three Mile Island, the monitoring system said that, that a vital valve had been activated. That's not actually what it was telling them. The little LED, the little light was actually telling that power had been applied to the valve. It didn't tell them that the valve was stuck. So it took them another two hours to figure this out and resolve through the, the meltdown of Three Mile Island. So UI matters. And I mean, when you look at things like the, SW, you know, the AWS outage or maybe the GitLab outage, where there's a typo in command or overly complex systems, um, UI matters. How many of you have removed the wrong device from a disk array? Two hands here. Um, how many of you have ever set, set up Hadoop or HGFS by scratch from hand, by hand? You are brave, brave, or dumb people. I'm not sure which. Um, how many of you use Debian and Precede for installation? That file really sucks, doesn't it? But Kickstart's a lot nicer because it's abstract and uses de a declarative nature. But I really love Debian. And I believe Tanya was touching on this, about how the UI we may use may be OK during normal operations. But what about the tools we use or have to use or the only tools we have left during a failure or an incident? Are they going to be up to, are they going to, be up to the task of helping us do the right thing? Does monodorama still happen? Yes. Good, good. Um, we're pretty good at logging. We have a lot of technology around logging. What we're missing, though, is a lot of structure in it. In the flight industry, there are maybe three or four common formats and standards for, for flight data recorders and all of the related um, telemetry involved in a flight so that you can research, reconstruct what happens from a flight almost programmatically. I don't know that we can do that from, var, from all the files in Varlog or Ganglia or watch. We might be able to do it with Corelight or used to be called Bro or you know, basically TCP dump, you know, operationalized. But most of, these, most of these logs that we have are unstructured, free format, and you need a human mostly to read them. Um, it's not really good for reconstructing events when you want to figure out what happened. Um, so I think we can do better, but I'm not quite sure how. Um, I'm going to throw some words together I've heard together uh, this week, which is uh, structured distributed tracing. I don't know what that means yet, but it sounds kind of cool. So maybe by next year, someone will figure out what it means so I can go see a talk on it and bring it back. Um, training is something we maybe don't do enough of or don't do enough of it well. Um, sure, we're all using checklists, but do you practice with the checklist? Do you train with the checklists? Um, do you have the equivalent of a flight simulator where people can practice doing these things? Some of you? Most of you? A lot of you? Okay. Um, um, in the flight industry, they have periodic refresher training. They have essentially auditors, check captains who come along and watch you doing your job and say, 
you're pretty good, but you're kind of you're, you're, you're kind of skipping a couple steps there, or you're forgetting about this step. Um, they also have a different take to training um, in some ways. Uh, they do pair training. The captain's in charge of the flight, but it's typically the first officer who's doing a lot of the difficult flying. Takeoffs, um, landings, maybe dealing with weather. Um, the idea is that the captain is now in a position of sharing their experience with the first officer um, and only takes over when they need to. So there's a lot of lessons about things that we can learn from other, from other industries, but let's talk about what can we share back. Um, and I'm going to be honest, just go watch the talks by Jason Victor and Peter Lega. They're way better at what I try, was going to try and talk about. And they have done two excellent talks about it, one last year, and, Jason, and uh, Peter gave a great talk this time about the things we can do, about how we can pass DevOps and use DevOps and Agile, constant integration, all the unit tests that we all know how to use, and use it in a regulated, um, traditionally waterfall environment. Because I actually don't work in those environments anymore. So I don't really know what it's like, but they do, and they give a great talk about it. So go watch the links, go watch their talks. Um, I said I had open questions and about a couple of ugly words. And one of them is external, is, is regulation, otherwise not, or licensing, or and whatever it is that people else want to throw at other industries that they feel have, that the government feels has gotten out of, out of control, or maybe natural monopolies. And I don't know how I feel about this. In some ways, there are certain things I would like. I would love to have something like the NTSB to be a third-party neutral moderator in invest you know, during investigations and major outages, especially when multiple parties are involved. But that comes with a lot of baggage, and I don't know how I feel about that. Maybe we definitely do need regulation in certain areas. That's why we have things like Sarbox and HIPAA and FERPA. And so maybe we can treat it like classified work, where you only do it when you need it in certain domains. And I don't really have any good answers for you here. I only have what I hope are maybe some really good questions. And maybe you have better questions than I do. Because I do think that there's hope. I do think we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. But we have a lot of people, not even in this room and not even in DevOps and sysadmin and operations, but in other industries we can ask for help. Do any of you know pilots? Do any of you know flight attendants, flight engineers? Do, are, are any of you actually pilots? There was one or two pilots here somewhere. There we go, all right. So we can all I'll go ask him a lot of aviation questions. <laughs> and so I don't think we're doomed, even though I do have a, a gazillion, gazillion, gazillion paper clips from that stupid game I played for too long. And um, I would like to stop now, because I've been talking for about an hour, and I should probably drink something. But I really want to thank you and invite you to ask me lots of really, really annoying questions. And if you really want to throw tomatoes at me, could you tell me where you got them from? Because I'm looking for tomatoes I might actually like to eat. <laughs> OK, I've had something to drink now. Oh god, the guy from SpaceX wants to ask me a question. <laughs> If, if you have questions, please use the microphone for the benefit of the recording. Hi, John. Hi, Matt. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for doing the talk. You did a good job. I liked it a lot. Oh, good, because I was uh, running at a mile a minute. <laughs> no, no, it was great. It was uh, an awesome uh, compendium of all the, the things that kind of I'd never seen tied together before, but I think um, were awesome. Uh, so. <laughs> You've obviously thought a little about it because you included it on your slides, but what do you think an effective regulation on what we do would look like? Because I feel like with the other organizations that have, uh, the other professions that have regulations, those regulations are written in blood. And we're not yes. yet in the position to have killed a lot of people, uh, but that time's changing quickly. And the, the analogy I used to use was, you have to have a master's degree in civil engineering to design an intersection, but you can come in as a high school student and run it. And that is mind-blowing to me, and at some point in time is going to impart regulation on us. What do you think the most effective way to do that is? Do you think we can get ahead of it and, and maybe like self-police in some way so that it, when it comes down, it's not onerous? So as you know, I have some friend, I have a, some family who work in the film industry, and they were telling me you know, about what life was like under the um, Hayes Act, 
where your movies had to be government approved to be shown. And one of the things, that's one of the reasons why we, we have the MPAA now, is that the MPAA took over regulation of movies as an industry operation. So that the government will never step, you know, will never stick their, their grubby little hands back into um, free media expression again. Um, and I think that might be a viable path for us. The question is, how do we all get along? Um, we don't have an academy of arts, you know, motion arts and pictures, motion pictures and arts. We don't really have a formal organization that we can, that I can join and say, I have signed a code of conduct. I have paid my dues, and that has longevity, like the National Academy of Sciences, or the National Academy of Engineering, or my local state bar. I can't practice law in the state of California unless I unless I unless I pass the bar, and that's how kind of how um, other you know some other industries that are not not, not life safety critical handle this is that they have managed to come into agreement with the government, saying we will manage ourselves so that one you don't have to. And two, we don't have to suffer the government regulating our industry. I think especially in Canada, the people here from Canada who are are either engineers or in America would be considered engineers uh, would, would completely echo that. I, I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm not up here to say last question. I'm actually here to ask a question. Um, I. Uh, you showed a lot about preparation in your yeah. talk and stuff that we can borrow um, for preparation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about borrowing from EMS and other groups for during incident response? Okay. Um, I can speak very closely to that. Uh, so as some of you who live in the Bay Area know, we suffered a number of um, horrible brush fires about two weeks ago. And one of the leading theories for why that happened was that the local utility company did not trim the trees around the power lines um, frequently enough. That's prevention. When we decide to clear brush, you know, dead brush out from around our homes when we live in the wilderness, that's prevention. When we decide to make sure that nothing with peanuts ever enters our child's diet, that's prevention. And so for us, what does prevention mean? Um, it might mean as much as hey, maybe I should make sure that I have enough drives in, in, you know, on hot standby for the rate array. Or maybe I should make sure that we have enough network providers so that when one goes down, we're not going to be off the network. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Chris. Hi, or John. Chris, sorry, Christopher. You can be as parsimonious with syllables as you choose. My question is a tiny bit vague because I feel a little bit vague about the topic, which is atoms versus bits. It struck me throughout your talk that one of the major differences between the airline field and our field is that we deal primarily in bits. Yes. And while there are, of course, bits in all of the complex processes and systems in the aviation industry, they tend to be in a support function or an enabling function. Can you talk at all about the difference between how atoms work in our world and whether that causes us to be more or less predictable, more or less robust to failure, more or less. What's the difference? Well, you know, there, some of the differences are very, very obvious due to physical constraints. Um, in an airplane, you can only have so many engines. I can't make a, I can't add, take an airplane and, six, and stick 20 engines on it to make it redundant against engine failure. It, 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 it's, it's not fuel efficient. But certainly I need more than maybe on an airliner, more than one engine. So we've settled on two engines for most modern airliners. Um, if I may want to make something redundant in my life, as long as I have money, I, keep on, I can keep on throwing hard drives at it. I can keep on throwing Amazon at it. I can keep on, keep on throwing as, much resources, as many resources as I, as I have money for, if I think it's that important. We don't have a lot of limitations that aviation does. Um, if there's a problem with a system, I can um, go into a bunch of different management systems. I can even SSH directly into nodes and systems and go, what's going on? You can't do that in the cockpit anymore. You used to be able to t t send the flight engineer down into the avionics bay and go, what's going on down there? Or look through a little window and go, what's going on with the, you know, with the front, you know, front landing gear? And that's not something that they have anymore because they've managed to automate so much away that they don't have that third person anymore. And that's one of the biggest, I think one of the most subtle differences is that 
we have this amazing ability to make things as redundant as we have money for. Airlines don't. And so it sounds like what you're saying is a very positive uh, hope, which is that because we don't have to deal with atoms, we can get better yes. substantially more so than aviation ever could. And I'm actually a little shameful that we haven't been as good at it. But we have hope. We can do it. Yes? Is there any are there any lessons from software that runs in highly regulated environments, for example, the software that runs on all those mo all the modern versions of the airplanes you mentioned. All that stuff has to go through strict yes, it controls does. and tests. And is there anything we can learn from? And actually, it seems to perform pretty well. People don't usually die from individual software bugs on airplanes. This is true. Um, I was actually um, I have a friend who works for a, an embedded real-time OS company um, located. Um, in the, let's call it Western United States, um, who is now working on certification for a certain um, architecture of CPU on a certain board for um, avionics. And he is now in the, I think now in the second month of writing the simple list of tests for the requirements. And one of the, one of the things I got out of, um, out, of, uh, out of the talk this morning was about how you can use um, continuous integration to make that suck less. Instead of writing all your tests up front, writing all your requirements up front, and then setting up a test infrastructure to test it all, you can write a test, commit it, document it, add it to the test rig, and then go on to the next one while things are while code generation, while code you know iteration is happening. So that can happen a little bit more agilely and a little less more like a waterfall that's going to drown you. I hope that answers a little bit. This is actually. I think I just answered the opposite of your question, so I'll come back and answer it again <laughs> after his question. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the points you stressed early on was that a lot of the industries you've mentioned are kind of in a war against nature, where nature kind of rolls dice, where we as humans try and impose order on the world, and then the world rolls dice and sometimes beats us. Usually beats us, in fact. Often. Uh, yeah. Um, we are trained as computer people that software is predictable and modelable and, and all of the consequences are determined at, at authoring time and all of that stuff. Do you, can you maybe say something on that disconnect and whether it's more pernicious than it might have first seemed? It's a, I would, I, I, it is somewhere between mostly fact and somewhat illusion. How many of you here have a, uh, an SSD in your laptop? If I understand the device electronics correctly still, um, each bit that you have stored is represented by about five electrons. That's not a whole lot of electrons. So if that's what's happening, and if we're just now starting to worry about running into quantum effects, dealing with um, uh, CPU, proce uh, CPU uh, manufacturing processes below 10 nanometers, I'm not always so sure that I trust the hardware that's running things. I might trust multiple instances of it and having them all agree, and having most of them agree. But I think we've, got, we've gotten by for a long time trusting the things that we build. And I think when we run things at scale, and as I'm sure people who work at much larger companies than I've ever worked at, um, they would also agree that when you start running things at scale, things stop agreeing with you. Things fail. Um, machines will produce different answers than the other 300 instances. Things that you wouldn't expect to happen will happen. It's just a matter of time and scale. And I was going to answer your question again. So working the other way, what can we learn from people who actually write avionics is actually bothering to write rigorous tests. It's a crazy idea. Um, but they are really good at writing tests and, and, and rigorously testing the hardware and, and, and software that they, that they build and write for avionics and testing to make sure it doesn't actually break and making sure that it doesn't actually fail. And that when it does fail, that it fails gracefully. I think a lot of systems we build don't necessarily fail gracefully. Sometimes when I have to deal with a Sometimes when I have to you know, deal with something horrible written in Java, Scala, using HDFS, Kafka, Spark, and a few other horrible systems that we might use, then I am sticking my hand into the box of pain at the beginning of Dune, and that I might not actually get my hand back. And I'm wondering how many other people feel like that when they work with the large systems that they work. 
either uses, builds, or tries to get other people to use. I'm curious if you have any ideas about what kinds of pressure we might be able to exert as individuals on our companies and on the industry as a whole. I know, but I don't know what's up with that. To help them uh, improve on some of these standards you've outlined. Like, what, what can we do? First of all, I think some of these things are easy sell. I think checklists are an easy sell. I don't think you're going to get anyone arguing about it other than getting people to actually do it, and then they start to love it. Um, checklists are basically documentation. And if your place doesn't care about documentation, you might want to find a new job. But maybe that's a little too presumptuous of me to say. Um, continuous integration and testing. I think that's a give, I think that's a, that's an easy one. That's a really easy sell. Um, team building exercises. Even if you've all been working with each other for five, you know, for five years or more, get together. You know, go off and do one of those team. What is up with that? Get, get together and do one of those team building exercises somewhere. Go off and spend some time together learning how to work with each other, doing something not, none of you know how to do. Um, one of the things I did with some coworkers about it, you know, five years ago is we went off and um, we chopped a bunch of wood in a back, in, you know, at some, you know, in someone else's backyard for a while. We none of us had ever done it before. I've never chopped wood before in my life, and we all learned how to do it. We all learned how to work together. And we all learn how to take, you know, take turns being in charge. And that was a really good learning experience for us. If you can do something like that, that kind of soft skills, without it being like a, a traditional kind of hokey, you know, hokey training exercise, I, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. I will, have, I will have the unicorn be the last question. There's something appropriate about that. <laughs> I'll try to make it a good one. Um, so you talked a little bit about vendor relationships, and specifically, I think you mentioned Qantas or something. Yes. Um, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on how we can do better with our vendor relationships and you know, avoiding the blame game, because we actually have the ability to destroy entire businesses yes. by pointing fingers, whereas it seems like you know, the uh, aviation industry, if a plane crashes, the people who manufactured that plane are still in business. They're still making planes. Everything's still good. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's one of those interesting differences. Um, so one of the flights I've referred to was a Qantas Flight 32, where um, an engine um, design fault or manufacturing fault resulted in a, in a, a huge Airbus 380 um, doing an emergency landing. It's, it's actually a great flight. I wish I had time to talk about it. But one of the interesting things is that the CEO, Qantas Airlines, basically in a press conference basically said basically said that the problem was clearly a design fault with the Rolls-Royce provided engines. They were maintained, they were designed and, and maintained by Rolls-Royce and, and the fault lies with them, with them. Which is not necessarily something I would ask, I would let my, you know, my CEO say in a press conference, at least until after the investigators started, but Rolls-Royce is still making engines because there's only three companies in the world that make engines for, for large commercial airliners. There's GE, there's Pratt & Whitney, and there's Rolls-Royce, and that's it. And if you're British, you're not gonna buy the two of them. <laughs> so, um, whereas, you know, if I said something bad about, you know, uh, oh, give me, uh, what's, what's a disc manufacturer I don't use? If I said something bad about, if I said, the, you know, we had a raid array die because of quantum drives, because they're out of business already, so it's okay, right? Uh, quantum drives. Well, one, I'm not so big, I'm not so big, but maybe you are, that you could probably cause your stock to drop six points. And I'm not sure what to do about that. I think the only real difference is that in the aviation industry, there were agreements about liability, there were agreements about investigations. I think the NTSB, it's actually a law that says NTSB investigations cannot be used for, as evidence in civil lawsuits. And I don't know if that's something that our industry is comfortable with. But that's, that's actually, I think, how it actually works, is that it's, people can sue the airlines, but they can't use the investigative material from, the, from, the, um, root cause, from their own you know, uh, safety investigation as part of the lawsuit. They have to show it independently. David's privilege. Uh, this mic, please. So on behalf, well, let's do a few things. Let's first thank John for his awesome keynote. Thank you.